Good morning, and welcome to worship at the United Methodist Church of Brantford on this World Communion Sunday. Christians all over the world will be celebrating the Lord's Supper, whatever their normal pattern of celebrating the Lord's Supper may be, whether it's quarterly or monthly or weekly, or as John Wesley said, frequent communion is not sufficient but he preached a sermon on the practice of constant communion. Every time we gather, according to John Wesley, we should be celebrating the Lord's Supper. It's that central to who we are as people of faith. Uh, that being said, we're having a uh, World Communion service uh, as a cooperative parish. The eight churches in our region, eight United Methodist churches in our region, We'll be having a service today at 11 o'clock at the Hamden Plains United Methodist Church. I'm going to be there doing the children's message, which means <laughs> I need to scoot about 10.15 today. Service may not be over by then, but we have provisions for completing worship here, uh, so you will be in good hands uh, for the conclusion of worship uh, if it is that I need to uh, leave before the benediction this morning. A few other announcements. Uh, our monthly mission uh, concludes, well, actually concluded uh, two days ago, uh, but if you still have diapers or baby wipes to bring in, uh, that has been our mission project for uh, the month of September. Uh, you may still bring them in. We staff the diaper bank on the second Tuesday of every month, uh, so we always have ways of getting those diapers and wipes uh, down to the diaper bank uh, for those who uh, benefit from those donations. Charge Conference will be held in two weeks. Two weeks from today, uh, Sunday, October 16th, at the Westville United Methodist Church from 2 to 5 o'clock in the afternoon. We do need to encourage carpooling. Parking is limited, uh, and they're combining two cooperative parishes, so we actually have 17 United Methodist churches that will be meeting uh, simultaneously. Uh, so uh, we do need uh, a few of us to go uh, and do the, uh, I'd love to have more than a few, uh, but we do need to carpool. So I believe we put a sign-up sheet out in Connector Hall. Uh, if you are able to attend from 2 to 5 on Sunday the 16th, if you would sign up there and we will work out carpooling uh, for that day. Uh, prayers of the people will be held later in the service. Those of you joining us online, uh, if you have access to the chat feature on YouTube, uh, feel free to put your prayer requests in there. Uh, you can do that at any time during the service. You don't need to wait until we get to the prayers of the people. In fact, uh, technology works wonderful until uh, we're kind of under pressure sometimes. Uh, so I would encourage you uh, to put your prayer requests in the chat uh, as soon as possible. Um, we don't want to miss them because of a, a delay in uh, technology. Uh, those of you in the room, obviously, when we get to that point of the service, we will uh, look around for your uh, prayer requests and praise reports. Uh, okay, our um, prayer calendar uh, for the week is available. If you didn't get it on the way in, love for you to pick it up on the way out. The uh, quote, which goes along with our stewardship campaign this week, is from Jeremiah 29:11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for good and not evil, plans to give you hope and a future. Isn't it comforting to know that the Lord has a plan for each of us? And our gathering thoughts come from Luke chapter 17, verse 6. If you had the faith the size of a mustard seed, Jesus said, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey you. Let us meditate upon those words as we receive the prelude.
Please stand and join me in the call to worship. We gather as God's people, bringing our fears and pain, knowing that when our spirits have grown cold, We gather as God's people, hanging our broken hearts on the branches of the tree of life, knowing that while friends may turn against us, we gather as God's people, hungering for healing and hope, knowing that even when life is no picnic, Continuing on the theme of faith, which you saw projected on the screen at the very beginning of the service, are two lessons today, both from the Hebrew Scriptures and from 2 Timothy, really are all about faith. So beginning with Habakkuk, the prophet, who preached to Judah, the southern kingdom between six, about 620 and 605 BC. It was a time when Israel had plunged back into sin, idolatry, the rich exploiting the poor. And they were blessed, though they didn't listen, to Habakkuk and two other colleagues of his Jeremiah and Zephaniah all at the same time. So here beginneth the first verse of the second chapter of, from the prophet Habakkuk. I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what he will say to me and what he will answer concerning my complaint. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision 
Make it plain on tablets so that a runner may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them. But the righteous live by their faith. After you have nourished your bodies and heard all, and this afternoon, find some time to nourish your spirits. Look at Hebrews 10.38 and the Apostle Paul in Romans 1.17 and Galatians 3.11 and you will find this theme of verse 4 quoted from Habakkuk, quoted by both of them. Uh, we proceed now to the epistle for this morning from 2 Timothy. Uh, just to remember that Paul the Apostle who sends Timothy his second letter is in prison at this time. It's a time of tremendous stress for Timothy who is almost like his son. So here beginneth the, first, the fifth verse of the first, uh, from the, uh, of the first chapter from 2 Timothy. I am reminded of your sincere faith a faith that lived first in your grandmother, Louis, and your mother, Eunice, and now, I am sure, lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through, in, through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Lord be with you. Let us pray together. O oh God,
The gospel lesson this morning comes from the gospel according to Luke, the 17th chapter, verses 5 and 6. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. The Lord replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, as we spend a few moments reflecting upon the truth of your word, grant us hearts and minds that are open to receive all that you would teach us, and grant us hands and feet that are willing to go forth and serve as you would lead us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Mark Batterson once said, time is measured in minutes, but life is measured in moments. But the question that comes to me this morning is not about measuring time and whether it's in minutes or moments, but how do you measure faith? Did you, did you hear where, where this passage started? The disciples came to Jesus. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. I mean, it, it, you know, my mind kind of works in mysterious ways sometimes, and I wonder, what, what did they actually expect Jesus to do? How, how is it that they thought Jesus might increase their faith? I mean, how do you measure faith anyway? We are a people who like to measure things. We know how to measure things. Every morning I get on the scale. I know someone, you shouldn't do it every day. You should wait for a process. No, every morning I get on the scale and I measure how well, how healthy I lived the day before based on how much I ate and how much I exercised. It's reflected right there on the scale. There's, there's no question. And so we can use a scale to measure something like mass. Or the carpenter would take a tape measure out to measure something, right? What do the carpenters say? Measure twice, cut once, right? We know how to measure things. Now, perhaps one of the most mysterious things to me as one who loves to cook is, are, are those things called measuring cups. How many of you, when you're looking at a recipe, pull out the measuring cups? How many of you say, I know about what I need? <laughs> right? Okay? See, there are two kinds of cooks. There are those who follow the recipe to the T. All right? Even when you have an instruction that says one quarter of a teaspoon. I mean, really. What difference does one quarter of a teaspoon make? <laughs> I mean, if a quarter teaspoon of vanilla is good for the chocolate chip cookies, wouldn't half a teaspoon be better? Or maybe I should just keep adding until I get the right taste or flavor that I'm looking for. We know how to measure things. We can measure volume with measuring cups. We can measure area with tape measures or mass with a scale. But then maybe it gets even more mysterious when we have to measure the size of a carry-on bag for the airline. Right? We get that little template that, that we're supposed to be able to stick our bag into that little box. And whoever decided that was the size that a carry-on should be anyway. We know how to measure things. But the disciples aren't trying to measure mass or area or volume. They say, Lord, increase our faith. How is it that we measure faith? Someone might say, what is faith anyway? And the writer of Hebrews tells us that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is being able to make visible the invisible, being able to see that which can't be seen, being able to understand the things that we hope for and receive the assurance that the Lord 
will provide, even when we may think that it's an eighth of a teaspoon and what difference is it going to make anyway? Faith is the assurance that the Lord will answer prayer. When the disciples ask Jesus to increase our faith, Jesus seems to question if they had faith anyway. Isn't that Jesus' way? Lord, increase our faith. Well, if you had the faith the size of an eighth of a teaspoon, no, because a mustard seed is even smaller than an eighth of a teaspoon. If you even had faith the size of a mustard seed, because anything less than a mustard seed would be almost nothing at all. But Jesus says to them, if you had the faith of even a mustard seed, you wouldn't need to say increase our faith. You would already have the faith needed to move mountains, to move mulberry trees. It's not about having some great size of faith. Just have faith, the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so we're encouraged to claim the faith that we have. And learn how to grow deeper in our relationship with Jesus. Why can we do this? Because God is faithful. Amen? God is faithful. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. In Lamentations chapter 3. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Because we know the Lord is faithful. All we need is faith, the size of a mustard seed. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hand. What wonderful words. Faith can be passed down. Not as an heirloom. Not as a physical thing that we pass on one from another. Like somebody, some grandmother might pass on the set of measuring spoons to a, a child or a grandchild. No, because we have lived by faith. Because we have experienced the Lord's faithfulness in our lives. We can share that faithfulness with others. We can let them know, look, here's how God has answered prayer. Here's how God has remained faithful in my life. And God will do the same for you. The mustard seed, one commentator said, the mustard seed is very small, but it has life in it. The mustard seed is very small, but it has life in it, and therefore it can grow and produce fruit. If our faith is a living faith, it will also grow and enable us to obey God's commands. Craig Greshel reminded us, don't ever measure God's unlimited power by your limited expectations or I would even say by our limited understanding. God can do far more than we could ever think or imagine. He goes on to say, just because you don't see anything doesn't mean God isn't doing something, amen? Just because you don't see anything, just because the answer to the predetermined answer to your prayers is not becoming reality does not mean that God is not at work. God may eventually work things out exactly the way we planned because they're exactly in line with God's plan. Or God may reveal to us a new or different way to answer our prayers that when we come to understanding will be much better than anything we could have thought or imagined in the first place. So the key thought I want to share with you this morning is this. Faith is increased as we witness and testify to answered prayer. Why do we have the prayers of the people? Because we are the body of Christ and we can encourage one another. 
We call it prayers, uh, we call the prayers joys and concerns, right? We bring our concerns, those who need healing, those who are seeking recovery, those who are living in traumatic circumstances and need to find the hope that God can provide, but we also share our joys, amen? Because those joys bear witness to answered prayer. So here's the challenge. We need to increase our follow through. Not just to every Sunday have joys and concerns. And truthfully, every Sunday, some of those joys and concerns, many of them change. Because we're human, right? We tend to move on. But here's the challenge for all of us to increase our follow through because faith is increased as we witness and testify to answered prayer, when a prayer is offered, whether it's in private or public, that is, whether we share it as a joy and concern here, or whether it's something you do in your quiet moments of the morning or the evening, when a prayer is offered, either in private or in public, write it down and make a list. Make a list and put it in writing so you can refer back to it because our memories are imperfect, yes? So when you offer a prayer before the Lord, if you're seriously coming before God, looking for God to intercede either in your life or the life of someone you care about, write it down, make a record of it, And later, as you refer back to your list, if that prayer is unanswered, keep praying. Keep praying. If the prayer that you refer back to, the one you wrote down, the one that was important enough to pray once in the first place, as you refer back to it, if it remains unanswered, keep praying. However, if it is answered, give testimony. Offer thanksgiving. Thank you, Jesus. And it's okay to come to worship and say, remember that prayer that I asked, remember that concern I had that I asked prayer for six months ago? It just got answered yesterday. And give testimony. Or maybe it was the one last week that was answered before you even got home on Sunday afternoon. Give testimony. So make note of the prayers you're praying. Write them down, refer to the list. Because if we don't write it down, we might think, oh, God never answers prayer. But you might just be a little surprised when you write them down, when you make a record, to see how many of those prayers God has answered. Yes, some exactly the way you were looking for, some maybe in a new and better way than you could have ever imagined. And some will still need prayer. And so we can be faithful in continuing to pray as God remains faithful in continuing to answer. The world measures success, Mark Batterson says. The world measures success by how much you make and how many people serve you. God measures success by how much you give and how many people you serve. And one of those great ways that we can serve one another is in prayer. By demonstrating our faith in the God who is faithful and interceding until the time that God brings an answer. Thanks be to God. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors.
continue with a few moments of silence for our personal prayers of confession before God. Hear the good news? Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. As those who are forgiven and reconciled before God and one another, I invite you to stand and greet one another with the peace of Christ. As you return to your seats, as you return to your seats, I invite you to remain standing for the beginning of the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You have made from one nation, you have made from one every nation and people to live on all the face of the earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Amen. I invite you to be seated as we continue in the attitude of prayer. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. He commissioned us to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth and to make disciples of all nations. And today his family and all the world is joining at his holy table. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is Christ is risen, Christ is Lord Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and fruit of the vine. 
Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. We know our communion with your church throughout the world, and strengthen it in every nation and among every people to witness faithfully in your name. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. All things are ready. The United Methodist Church, we celebrate an open communion table. Everyone is welcome at the table which Christ himself has provided. For those of you joining us online, if you have your consecrated elements, I invite you to receive both the wafer and the cup at this time. Those of you here in the room, I invite you to come forward using the center aisle to receive a wafer and to take a cup from the tray, returning to your seats using the side aisles. There are baskets on the sides for your empty cups, so you may dispose of them as you return. Please come and receive the Lord's Supper.
Please join me in the prayer after receiving. Good morning. This is our last one. So we all know our verse. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear them from heaven and forgive their sins and I will heal their land. We've been talking about Healing for the broken, hope for the lost, last week home for all, we got a song to go with that, but it all starts with God has a plan for us, for you, for me, for the church, and it starts with the heart. So today we're going to talk about the heart, and I am your speaker for the day, so let me share where that I led where that led me. First of all, very important, the Bible verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I, know I, for, I, shoot, for I know the plans I have for you, saith the Lord. Plans for good and not evil, plans for hope and a future. And this was our Bible verse. I don't know if anyone but me remembers this, but this was actually our key Bible verse last year, and it was about hope and a future. But what I want you to hear today is, for I know I have, for I, for I know the plans I have for you, about the plans. God has a plan for us. God has a plan for me, Carol, for you, Gus, Sam. Each of us has a plan. We live in a world of chaos. 
There's climate disasters. There's economic strife. There are wars and conflicts, both close by and far away. And it feels like it's escalating, like it's spiraling. Or at least that's how it feels to me. Our God is not a God of chaos. Our God is a God of plans. And he has a plan for me. But our calling is to live God doesn't call us to sit and wait. Well, I'm going to come back to that. God doesn't call us to just exist. God calls us to live. And he calls us to live fully human, physically. We are to enjoy the food we eat, granted in moderation. We are to try to enjoy the exercise. Some of us do and some of us don't. We are to enjoy our family. We're to enjoy our friends, our travel. We are to enjoy the physical part of our life. And, and this is the tough part, we are also to live as children of God, which means a spiritual life. That's where the real life comes from. It's not the physical, but the spiritual, where we are to live as people who are hoping the faith the mystery of faith that we talked about today, the hope for the future, how we measure success, how we look at what we want to do. We are to live, and that's our calling. It's a conundrum because the physical and the spiritual don't exist side by side easily. It's a constant tension for us between those two. And then we know God has a plan. Okay, so we have chaos and calling. God has a plan. And there's only two things I know about God's plan besides, well, two things. One is that it's unexpected. Our God's not a predictable God. So whatever I think is going to happen is not the way it's going to happen. And two is that it's for hope and a future. So when we think about this, I will share that this whole chaos, calling, and plan is something that God's been talking to me about personally. And I don't know how well you've gotten to know me or not, but I am a doer, not a waiter. And God has been talking to me about waiting on the Lord. And I hate it. I really, really hate it. So he's been working with me about, I am not the one in control of my life. I'm not the one that gets to decide if I actually trust in God that I am to lean on him, that I am to wait on him, that I am to trust him completely. And I have a situation going on in my life where I am ready to act. I'm ready to, I'm ready. I am so ready. And God keeps saying, wait. And so I've sent out smoke signals. I'm like, God, prayers is what I mean. I say, God, you've got to reinforce because, you know, (laughs) I'm ready to go, I see the where I want to go, and I feel like you're, you're giving me this hold back. And he has me reading about in Samuel where God sent anointed David to be the king and then sent him into the wilderness and gave him numerous opportunities to overtake Saul, who was trying to kill him, and what did God tell David and praise David for? Not doing it, waiting. It's funny how God puts things in your life and you're like, okay, Lord. So then I'm like, okay, God, but I can get ready. I can do all the things around it so that when you're ready to act, I'm right there ready with you. And God's like, no, sweetie. (laughs) You are to wait on me. You are to rest by the springs of life. And it is really hard. And God says to me that it's about the heart. And this is where this comes. Doing his will starts by trusting him in the face of chaos. He asks us to honor him with his physical heart. That's doing as he asks with strength and purpose. That's what that means to me. And with our spiritual heart. Loving and praising him regardless of the circumstances and then trusting him that he cares for me personally, that he has a plan for hope in the future and that he will act in his time. 
And so as we think about our heart, we think about what Pastor Kitten shared, the measure of success is how we serve and how much we give. And the heart is at the core of who we are. Okay, so we've had a, a reflection question every single week. I'm not going to read all the reflection questions this week. We're at the last one, but this is the one to take home with you. you how am I reflecting God's grace in my prayers, my words, my actions, and my heart? So that we are doing, we're praying, we're speaking, we're living, but it's our heart where it all starts. Okay, so this is the Sunday that the pledge cards are due. How many people have turned in their pledge cards? Hey, hey, John. Those of you that have not, because we had not filled ours out of the, as of this morning, if you have your packet, there's a pledge card and a pin in there. However, I've got good news for you. If you don't have your packet sitting right outside on the table, right where uh, Sue and Diane greet us as we come in, are a bunch of pledge cards and a bunch of pins. Feel free to grab and turn that in. You can hand it to John. You can hand it to Lori. You can hand it to me. You can put it in the... Um, the uh, box, mailbox in the office, but it would help. We have our, um, what's it called, on October 16th, where we have to come together and do the budget. Charge conference, thank you so much. So it would really help John and the team to be prepared for that by knowing what our intentions are. And it's a time, talent, and treasure intentions. Who do we choose to be as a church? There's a write-in space. Write something in if you want to. Okay, we are at the end of stewardship and now moving to prayers of the people. So we've got prayers, concerns, and let's not forget uh, praise for if there's something that you want to share um, of uh, answered prayer we talked about. I just want to let everybody know that my son, and who lives in Titusville, Billy, and his wife, Chris, were safe. They didn't have any damage to their house. And when I talked to them, they hadn't even lost electricity yet, unless they were going to later on. He wasn't sure. But he was at work at, at Eastern Connecticut, I mean, Eastern Florida State University, so when he called me. So, and God answered my prayers because that's what I prayed for. <laughs> that is fabulous. Thank, thank God for those who are spared of this horrible situation in Florida. May God be with all the rest of the people who are suffering and have lost everything. Let's not forget the Ukrainian people. It's going from bad to worse. May God be with all of them. Just want to add to it that my prayers are with the people who are there and who have suffered, and I feel so bad for them. We knew you prayed for them. We have several online, so I'll read those for you. Um, Sandy is asking prayers for her friends and family uh, who are in Florida and have had damage. Um, and Judy and Mike are asking prayers for Mike's aunt, Janet. Um, she got COVID and she had to go into the hospital and be intubated. Um, she has a blood clot and she's not expected to recover. So prayers for Mike and, and for the whole family. And Emmy is asking prayers for her sister-in-law, Mary, who is having back surgery this week. And um, finally, on a final um, a note, uh, I want to ask prayers for Pastor Ken's father. He uh, had some more tests done and the cancer is back um, in his bladder now this time. So he's having a procedure done on October 19th to remove uh, the cancer that's in the bladder. And then they go from there, depending on what stage it is, whether he has chemo or, or what the treatment will be. So prayers for him. Uh, two things. Um, my dad, who's 90, will be having knee replacement surgery next Wednesday, so please pray for him that everything 
comes out right and that he can finally walk without pain after this procedure. And a joy, uh, Bob and I are celebrating our 40th wedding anniversary today and I just, thank you. I just thank God that he gave me someone, a partner that I can live my life with and be so happy with. And I just give him thanks and praise for that. And I would do it all over again too. <laughs> My son, uh, our son, Tim, is in Florida with four of, of his workmates that are electricians repairing some of the damage, if they can, with um, 43,000 other electrical workers. And he, he was sent to Fort Myers, which is the worst. He said it's absolutely devastated. We don't know when he'll be back, a couple of weeks or a month or next week, who knows. But he's uh, trying to help. Prayers for Mary Gail, that answers and treatment can be found for her continual pain and unstable mobility. Thanks. Uh, this is just a praise also to do with the Florida hurricane. My mother lives in Port Charlotte and was uh, working at an assisted living facility during the hurricane. and. Um, she is safe, no one was injured, although there was a fair bit of damage. And when she finally got home, also there was minimal damage at her house. So we're very, very grateful. It was, it was a tense day waiting. So prayers for that. Uh, prayers for Janet Veets and for her son Keith, who's having surgery this week. He had some uh, cancer on his face and now he's having um, plastic surgery. Emmy also adds that she wanted to praise God for her visit last week, and she was just so happy to be home and to see all of you. Thank you, Emmy. That was a wonderful praise. We enjoyed you. Anyone else? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you humbly with open hearts, hearts seeking reassurance, giving you praise, asking you in the midst of everything to light the fire of joy in our souls. Lord, we pray for Florida. Father, so much near and dear, we have people close to us who weathered the storm and thought, Father, thank you that they weathered it well. We have people from us who are helping those in such dire need. And Lord, our hearts just go out. There's so much devastation and, and unbelievable chaos. Father, you have a plan. We trust your plan, but we ask for your mercy. We ask for blessing. We ask for healing. We ask for hope. Father, we have places throughout the world. Ukraine was mentioned. We have others as well. That Lord, we also ask for your blessing for your hope, for your purpose. Lord, we ask for good, not evil. We trust you. Lord, we have those in our midst who are sick with unknown. Lord, with things that don't look good. And Father, we know that you are the God who created each of us. You number the hairs on our head. Lord, we ask for healing we ask for, if it's end of life, Father, we ask for your blessing with that transition, that it's a moment of peace. Lord, we ask for healing. Those that are having tests done, that are figuring out what to do next, we ask for the doctors to know. And Lord, we pray for family, it's so hard, not just for the one who's sick, but for those around, the support. Lord, we thank you for the praises, for the anniversaries, for Emmy's visit. Father, we, we thank you for the, the good things in our midst. And Lord, we ask this all in Jesus' name.
Amen. We are ending with our offertory prayer. Um, and uh, I think it is a beautiful thing as we think about the mystery of faith and the measure of success. So um, I want to pray for our offertory. <laughs> Thank you for the blessings. Lord, thank you for the plan, even when we don't know what that plan is or when that plan is. Father, thank you for the many good things that you've given us, the God-given gifts, so that we can give back to you for the God-given tasks. Father, bless this offering of our time, of our talent, of our treasure, in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. So I get to finish up. <laughs> um, as you know, we have our, our benediction. We can re read responsibly. This is what the Lord says. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. Just remember as you leave today that God has a plan for you and most of all that he loves you so much. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>